Hello, and welcome to the second of our webinars, A Sectoral Approach to Climate Mitigation. Here we are analyzing climate change and trying to understand solutions at the sectoral level, as it seems that sometimes at the nation state level, we have not been entirely successful in framing a path forward. So today we're very fortunate to uh, speak about the energy sector. Uh, the energy sector has been the focus of many, many mitigation efforts to date. And we have experts with us from energy innovation, from the Center for Environmental Policy, and from the Electric Power Research Institute. And indeed, it gives me great pleasure at this moment to uh, introduce Gabriela Siegfried, uh, she's going to moderate today's event. She's a senior sustainability analyst at the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI, where she leads energy industry research on international climate disclosure, ESG reporting, the circular economy, and equitable decarbonization. So without further ado, Thank, thank you, Gab, for being with us and um, and for moderating this discussion. Thank you, Todd. It's great to be here. I um, had a long working relationship with American University Center for Environmental Policy, and I'm glad to um, combine my alma mater with my current work at EPRI. So our panelists today will be Mike O'Boyle of Energy Innovation. He is the director of the firm's electric program, which focuses on designing and quantifying the impacts of policies needed to affordably and reliably decarbonize the US electricity grid. Next is Michelle Solomon, a policy analyst in the electricity's program at Energy Innovation. Excuse me, that's where Michael Boyle is as well, if I didn't make that clear. And Michelle is working to accelerate the transition to a clean and affordable electricity sector in the US from our very own AU Center for Environmental Policy is Daniel Fiorino, the founding director of the Center for Environmental Policy and a distinguished executive in residence at American University School of Public Affairs. Dan Fiorino is the author and co-author of seven books and some 60 articles and book chapters. So it's great to have him as the discussant for today's panel. I will allow Michelle a moment to get her slides together. Um, and we will go ahead and start with a brief presentation and then lead into Q&A in the final portion of this webinar. Thanks so much, Michelle and Michael, take it away. Thanks so much. Okay, hopefully the slides are sharing and I think Mike will kick it off for us. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, it's so great to be here. Thank you, American University for having us. Um, the title of the webinar <clears throat> and presentation is Decarbonizing the Energy Sector. And I thought for a sec, wow, that, that might be kind of a misleading or mis misnomer for folks. But as you'll see, um, the electricity sector, which will be the focus of this webinar, in a net zero future will comprise basically most, if not uh, you know, the vast majority of energy that's delivered to folks. Um, because many end uses need to electrify in order for us to uh, reach a net zero economy. So in many ways, it's a very appropriate focus of this webinar and uh, looking forward to presenting alongside my colleague, Michelle. Next slide. So here's a brief agenda for what we're going to cover. Um, first, we'll talk about the imperative to decarbonize the electricity sector, why that sector is so important from an emission standpoint. Second, we'll talk about what phases uh, that decarbonizing this sector typically goes in, and I'll pass that to Michelle. Then we'll turn to some policies, uh, a rel relatively short list uh, of policies that can drive decarbonization of the electricity sector. And then finally, relate that to other sectors that will follow in this webinar series. Next slide, please. Uh, so why the electricity sector? Um, this graphic, if you have been 
watching the, the previous uh, presentation by our colleagues on energy innovation, you'll be familiar with this graphic, but um, each box in this graph represents a single sector in a single country. So the verticals are lined up by country uh, and then uh, the colors co uh, correspond to different sectors. And you can see the yellow orange sector is electricity. It's, it's quite large. Um, China's electricity sector uh, is, the si is the second largest emitting single sector of any uh, country sector in the world. Um, but electricity itself um, accounts for about 15 per or 25 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions, and that's mostly emissions from coal-fired power plants, and then also a significant amount from gas and oil-fired power plants as well. So decarbonizing that is really key to reaching a net zero future. Next slide, please. So a quick snapshot at what global electricity sector emissions have been up to. This data is from the International Energy Agency. <clears throat> and you can focus really, I think, on two wedges of this graph, the light blue one, which is coal, and the light green one, which is natural gas. Those have been the two sectors um, or the two fuel sources that have been driving up global greenhouse gas emissions from the electricity sector. And the growth has been primarily driven, especially in the last uh, 15 years or so, um, in China and increasingly in India. Um, so while there have been uh, significant gains or progress in greenhouse gas emission reductions in, for example, the United States, which was majority coal as early as um, sort of 20 years ago, um, now uh, those are being more than offset by growth in emissions in other developing countries um, as their electricity loads grow tremendously and coal has been the primary source uh, to meet that growing demand. Clean electricity uh, is sort of the slivers at the bottom uh, and you can see just emerging in the 2010s uh, wind and then the little purple sliver of solar power. Um, those are growing extremely quickly, um, but this gives you a sense of how much they have to grow relative to the incumbents to make a dent in global greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide, please. So um, regional electricity generation uh, varies a lot from country to country, um, but global electricity emissions are highly concentrated in four countries and regions. So China, the US, Europe, and India account for almost 70% of electricity sector emissions. So focusing uh, policy efforts, technical assistance, et cetera, on those countries is really um, key to um, keeping or sort of peaking and, and driving down greenhouse gas emissions in electricity globally. Um, and still, even in uh, the Europe and the US, uh, electricity is predominantly coal, gas, uh, and nuclear. Next slide, please. So all of this <clears throat> sort of paints, I think, uh, a picture of greenhouse gas emissions still increasing, some, um, some you know, big challenges when we really need to be peaking and, and rapidly decreasing greenhouse gas emissions in the electricity sector. But there's also a story um, of technological evolution and, um, and really optimism um, that allows us to really, at this moment, and it's already starting, really pivot, stop investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure, and uh, rapidly grow our uh, investments in carbon-free electricity, uh, especially with wind and solar power. So in this graphic here, you can see over the last 12 years or so, solar power uh, levelized costs on average, and this is an international um, summary from IRENA, have fallen about 90%, uh, and wind has fallen about 70%. Um, that's a huge change. And you can see um, the sort of gray box in this graphic represents the range of costs to build new fossil fuel resources. So pretty much worldwide, you've got a phenomenon now where the cheapest new energy sources are also carbon-free and renewable. Um, this means we can go much faster on the clean energy transition without raising costs. Um, in the US, for example, uh, this sort of cost crossover, like we like to call it, is, is particularly acute, especially after the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, um, we found in a recent paper that 99% of the, 
of existing coal plants have higher going forward operating costs than new uh, regional or local renewable resources. So you can actually not just see clean energy being the primary new resource, but it starts to displace existing fossil fuels without raising costs. Next slide, please. So if you can take one takeaway from this presentation, I would say it's that existing technologies provide a pathway for near-term decarbonization that's feasible and affordable. Um, I'm not talking about getting to zero emissions, but because wind and solar are so cost-effective um, and the way to um, integrate those resources is relatively well understood at this point, um, studies uh, by academic institutions like UC Berkeley are converging on a pathway to getting to 80 to 90 percent carbon-free electricity in a relatively short amount of time. So um, these are just three examples of studies in the US, Japan, and China, where um, a same, the same group of researchers with which Michelle and I have partnered um, have made this finding, have done this analysis using um, sort of advanced computer modeling techniques um, and, and showed this. So uh, that is sort of our overall takeaway that we don't wanna lose the forest for the trees and, and focus on you know, how do we get all the way to zero? There's a lot we can do right now to get from uh, relatively dirty power mixes in each of these countries to a mostly and almost entirely clean system. Next slide, please. Okay, let me pass it to Michelle. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, so our next section of um, this presentation will focus on the phases of electricity decarbonization, because while we see that pathway, um, the way in which we think about and plan for the electricity grid changes as we increase the share of renewables on the grid. So we tend to think about it in sort of four phases of electricity decarbonization, where the first phase is kind of the old historical paradigm where we've just built our system um, kind of for our peak load times, and we just have kind of a set of resources for that. Um, the second phase is a transitional phase where we start building more low carbon resources. Um, and we start to ramp those up before really kind of taking old fossil off the grid. The third phase, we're moving into much higher renewable energy penetrations um, and starting to kind of ramp down our fossil, um, which requires a much more flexible grid as renewable sources of electricity provide um, power at different times of the day. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about this fourth phase or full decarbonization, so kind of even past that 80 to 90 percent um, clean electricity that Mike was just talking about. And uh, kind of hearkening back to that slide where we saw where uh, kind of the global electricity sector is at today with those really, sl really small slivers of wind and solar, um, most countries are still in this kind of phase two or transition phase where we're still working on scaling those low carbon resources. So before diving into kind of the details of the phases, we'll just give a little overview of some of the grid basics to keep in mind as we shift how we plan for the electricity grid. So first, supply and demand must be kept in constant balance. And those physics are the same, uh, even where politics differ. Um, the second point here is that electricity poles and wires are a natural monopoly. And a natural monopoly is an industry where it's most efficient um, to have kind of one entity uh, kind of controlling them. So if you think about it, it wouldn't make much sense to build out two kind of sets of transmission transmission wires and distribution wires across the country um, because they're really expensive and really uh, res resource intensive to build. So um, instead we have one system that can be shared across different utilities. Um, and because there's just that one system and no opportunity for others to kind of come in and create competition, the prices of um, those poles and wires are set or approved by uh, electricity regulators. Um, and finally, uh, competition is something that's been kind of un unevenly introduced in other parts of the electricity sector, particularly in generation. So in the United States, 
Uh, we have a lot of utilities that still own and operate power plants, but in other regions, we're starting to see independent power producers building power plants, which is actually a really productive kind of paradigm for new renewable resources that tend to be a lot cheaper. So where you have competitive markets, it can be, it can better incentivize those cheaper renewable resources to come onto the grid. So now diving into those phases, again, phase one was kind of our old historical uh, kind of method for planning the electricity grid. And it was really focused on baseload power. And baseload power is uh, basically power plants that are running 100% of the time almost and providing the electricity that you need all of the time. So um, in the United States, that's been primarily nuclear and coal. And those types of power plants are really hard to, or harder to ramp up and down and turn on and off. So it's much better to run them all of the time. The second category is, um, you know, those loads that vary over the course of the day. So we have slightly higher electricity demand in the morning and the evenings when people are at home and using their appliances and things like that. And so for those, we have power plants that are a bit better at being kind of ramped up and down and turned on and off. And that's been primarily gas combined cycle plants in the U.S. And finally, we have our peak load, which occurs on days like hot summer days when everybody's running their air conditioning and you have much higher electricity demand that you do on other days of the year. And for those, um, that's when you're relying on your most expensive power plants, which tend to be these gas and oil peaker plants. So that's how we thought about electricity historically is what power plants can we run 100% of the time, which ones can run, you know, to kind of pick up at the morning and evening, and which ones do we need for those peak days? Phase two, on the other hand, um, we're starting to have our cost-effective variable renewable resources shift the way we think about the grid. So, and this is an example from California last April, where at about 3.45 p.m. on April 3rd, uh, renewable electricity met 97% of the electricity demand in the state. And so what that means is that, um, yeah, we had, uh, basically, if you had a resource that was running 100% of the time, you would have supply actually um, kind of outpaced demand at that point. So instead, what we need when we're getting renewable electricity that can provide almost 100% of our demand at times is resources that can ramp up and down really quickly and a lot more flexibly to meet uh, those times of the day when the sun is going down. So taking a moment to kind of dive more into grid flexibility and what our options are there, uh, kind of the first option is improved markets and operations. So this is making sure that we value the benefits of flexibility better in our markets. It's making sure that we are able to forecast our wind and solar outputs um, really well so that we can predict what other resources we need to come on at certain times. The next is demand side flexibility. So taking advantage of the fact that customers can shift the times of the day that they're using electricity. So, you know, instead of running their dishwasher right when they get home at 5 p.m. Maybe that's something that can be done later on in the evening. Or, um, you know, if there's a hot water heater, maybe it can kind of use electricity to heat up water during the middle of the day when electricity is abundant, whereas um, not use it at those peak times. And you can incentivize those using time of use rates that make electricity more expensive during those ramping times and less expensive when renewables are readily available. Next is grid infrastructure, so actually building out more transmission lines and things like that. And this can be really important because you can imagine um, there's variation in weather across the country. And if you're able to take electricity from one region to another, you can kind of compensate for that variable weather. And then finally, there's flexible supply, which can be you know, just other sources of electricity that can ramp up and down quickly. And that can be fossil power plants, that can be lithium ion batteries, other storage technologies and uh, pumped hydropower. So I just mentioned how transmission can be really important um, in grid flexibility to compensate for weather variation. Um, but it's also really important to actually just get renewable electricity to demand centers. So on this map here, um, 
it's showing where the best renewable resources um, and even fossil resources are in the United States. And of course, there is wind power in uh, North Carolina and solar power in the Northeast, but this is showing where the best resources it, resources are. So you can see that you know there's really good solar resource here in the Southwest. Um, and there is there is still good solar resource here, but it would be really great if we could transport some of this electricity to bigger population centers here or be able to take this really strong wind resource that's kind of in the upper Midwest and take it to the east and west coast there. So transmission can be really important to help make sure that we're using our highest quality resources and getting them to load centers. So as we move through these phases of decarbonization, and I'll start talking about the those last two phases, um, one of the key questions is, you know, what is the role of fossil resources in a system that must fully decarbonize? And again, you know, we're just starting to ramp up our clean resources now in a lot of places. So we're somewhere around here. So we're starting to reach the phase where clean really goes up and fossil starts going down. And this is a really, this transitional period is um, a really important time because it's a time in which uh, if you don't make sure that you balance what you're building carefully with what you're retiring, you could end up with sort of an electricity shortage. And renewables, uh, it's been shown in many studies, such as those ones that Mike pointed out, high renewable systems can be really reliable, but only if you have enough. So it's really important to make sure that we are, uh, you know, building that clean first before we're retiring our fossil. Um, so moving into phase three, so even beyond that 80 to 90% renewables, um, or I guess, <laughs> well, before that, um, kind of moving from this ramping phase into uh, a phase where we start to have renewables take up, you know, maybe 60% of our grid, um, the, cons the considerations start to change even further. So this graph on the left here is showing our total installed amounts of wind, solar, batteries, gas, and coal. And what we see here is that as we move into the 2030s, not only do we have our wind and solar amounts ramping up to meet kind of our clean energy goals, but we also have a lot of storage. And we also see that that amount of storage is increasing in size relative to that wind and solar. So as we add more wind and solar, we also need to add kind of proportionally more storage in order to add the additional uh, grid flexibility to be able to get to those, you know, close to 50% renewables. And when you count nuclear, close to 60% clean. Um, so that just goes to show the importance of additional flexibility as we get to those higher renewable percentages. And then finally, as we move towards even 100% clean electricity, um, the technology set that we need to look at expands because um, as we can, I'll just kind of focus on this scenario here, um, which looks at a 100% clean electricity scenario. And what we see is a lot of wind and solar, just like those 80 and 90% scenarios from the US, Japan, and China. Um, but we see a much uh, kind of broader set of resources available here to meet this last 10 to 20%. So that's including everything from um, kind of hydrogen and hydrogen power plants, nuclear, potentially natural gas with CCS, potentially some kind of bioenergy with carbon capture. So we what we're seeing is kind of still a need for some firm clean resources that can come online uh, you know, when you need them and when there are weather events that are decreasing wind and solar output. So um, kind of what we're looking at here is we have some existing technologies that could meet that need, but there's also oops, also a lot of technologies in development that could start meeting that need as well, such as long duration energy storage, um, demand flexibility, hydrogen, geothermal, and of course, carbon capture is still kind of in its early phases of development. So that could become a player as well, and potentially even some more that we don't have yet. So even beyond that, kind of 100% renewable energy, it's important to remember that a lot of clean electricity targets uh, center on 2030 and 2035. But even if we reach 100% clean electricity by 2035, 
decarbonization of our electricity grid doesn't start there because other sectors are going to start relying on the electricity sector to provide energy. So um, right around here is about 2035 and you can see our electricity uh, demand is just over kind of 5,000 terawatts terawatt hours a year. But as transportation electrifies, as um, industry electrifies, as buildings electrify, we're gonna see a kind of doubling or even tripling of the grid. So uh, we don't need to, we, we need to get to clean electricity quickly, but we need to keep on building more even past that. And I will turn it back to Mike to talk about some of the policies that can get us there. All right. <clears throat> Uh, I think you can go to the next slide. I will preface this section just by highlighting that, um, you know, Michelle's uh, setting the stage of the last section that the electricity sector is a particularly highly regulated sector, um, you know, means that market forces or cheap, elect cheap clean electricity, et cetera, um, they only do so much. Um, and so, and, and also because it's so, the control over the grid is so highly concentrated in monopolies, in regional uh, transmission operators. Um, you know, policy is, and, and utility regulation in particular, is a major, um, you know, sort of central lever. So the number of policies, um, you know, it's not necessarily like, say, buildings where you really need to focus on getting individual people to, to switch, you know, from, from gas or oil to electricity, um, we're talking about very centrally managed um, systems with relatively few um, actors. It's still extremely complicated, um, but policy just plays such a central role. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go through and sort of highlight five or six key policies. Um, it's not the full exhaustive list, but these are the things that we feel are some of the most important priorities for policymakers uh, that want to achieve a, a low or zero carbon grid. So first, um, supply side policy, meaning policies that um, push uh, utilities to purchase more clean or carbon-free electricity. And these kind of fall into two buckets. One is a set of policies called renewable or clean electricity standards. Uh, and these require utilities to purchase increasing shares of clean electricity. On the right, you have a graph of the United States where it highlights every state that has passed a legislative requirement for utilities to hit 100% clean um, electricity. Uh, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Washington, DC also did, but um, couldn't fit it on the graphic. Sorry about that. No offense to those, um, those states. Um, and then feed-in tariffs are another strategy. So those are um, basically subsidies um, but instead of uh, just reducing the cost that, you know, um, of the investment, they guarantee revenue to developers. So um, it'll be like a long-term contract um, or, or subsidy where the developer gets a certain amount of revenue kind of as a bonus or adder, and those can be structured administratively, fixed price or competitively, um, but it's a very uh, important and popular policy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the second bucket that I wanted to highlight is proactive planning and building of transmission. So um, these are sort of, transmission is a long-term uh, struggle, especially um, in the United States and Europe, uh, where siting is particularly difficult. Um, so, in the long term, we really need to build out our transmission infrastructure, both to link demand centers with high quality renewable resources, but also just to strengthen the links between different areas in the grid to take advantage of resource diversity, um, to increase the reliability contributions of variable wind and solar resources. Um, and that takes a proactive sort of long-term planning approach. Um, so needing to plan kind of a multi-value transmission planning process that essentially means, um, you know, recognizing the reliability, the economic, and the public policy benefits of transmission, something that's been done successfully in the mid, uh, Midwest, U.S., um, using high-voltage transmission technology, 
um, to connect renewable rich regions and sort of pipe that energy um, to far away places without major transmission losses. Um, and then proactively engaging communities and subnational governments to, to proactively develop corridors, right? So in a very complex system like Europe or, or the US, um, we have to figure out where the transmission can go, kind of pre-approve or pre-site that transmission. Uh, and then it lays the groundwork for sort of faster build out once those projects are ready to go. But in the near term, we also know that there are sort of advanced technologies um, that can increase the capacity of the existing grid and didn't want and want to make sure that we highlight those, um, you know, grid enhancing technologies like advanced conductors. So laying a new wire with more transfer capacity, um, dynamic line ratings uh, that just has to do with putting advanced sensors on lines um, and, you know, recognizing when they have more transfer capacity than say they're rated for. Next slide, please. Um, the second one, the third one here that I want to highlight is linking regional systems. So wider footprints, wider areas um, over which electricity supply and demand are balanced is a key strategy for integrating renewables and for planning transmission. Um, so a great example of this, I promise I'll go beyond the United States, um, but uh, a great example of this is in the Western US where Currently, they're building a market kind of piece by piece um, from California to the other Western states. And in this map, you can see um, all the orange areas are now participating in something called an imbalanced market um, and soon to be um, a, a more integrated sort of day ahead market. These are technical terms. I won't get wrapped up in them. But the basic uh, idea, right, is uh, as there's more renewable energy in the region, there are more excesses and deficits. and so this market that they're building allows for more efficient real-time trading, more efficient real-time awareness of where there are those surpluses and deficits. And basically you can meet demand more cheaply. Um, you can also start to use that data to identify where a new big transmission line would be very valuable. Um, but the key here is you have to overcome uh, sort of local control and trust issues. So there's a need to develop um, common governance frameworks. Uh, so either neighboring countries, say in Europe or subnational governments in China or the US, they have to sort of know that yes, there may be some local control that's lost, but the gain is uh, lower cost electricity, lower carbon electricity, and the ability to kind of keep going on the renewable energy transition. And I will say, this is definitely an issue in China where balancing is at the provisional, provincial level. So this is an issue that sort of uh, resonates in more places in the US. Next slide, please. Um, we also have to focus on policies that leverage the demand side. So um, you know, utilities generally don't have a great interest in selling less of their product. So policy has a big role to play in providing efficiency incentives to customers, uh, providing bonuses to utilities that do a good job with efficiency, um, and then with uh, vehicle electrification, industry electrification, and the emerging hydrogen economy, you have an increasing amount of very flexible sort of customer batteries um, where uh, the demand can be very flexible. And so that can provide value back to the grid if regulators, utilities, and customers can kind of agree on frameworks where you know the utility can call on that resource when there is, say, some of the ramping or low or over supply of renewables issues that Michelle was alluding to, um, especially with hydrogen, uh, where an entire electrolyzer can kind of ramp up or ramp down, it looks a lot more like a supply side resource. So thinking of demand with supply is another key way to reduce costs and increase um, sort of the pace of change. Next slide, please. Uh, Another thing that needs to be addressed is utility incentives. So utilities should be financially motivated to rapidly decarbonize at a low cost. And in many ways, uh, they already are. Um, utilities generally make money when they invest capital. That's what they're built to do. Um, and their, their capital uh, costs are built into rates. So the idea that they could invest in a bunch of new capital intensive wind and solar projects, that's ostensibly attractive to them. The problem is 
what happens to their legacy fossil infrastructure that say was supposed to continue to operate for 10 to 20 years or even uh, beyond that. So uh, there's a big policy puzzle to figure out who pays for fossil uh, projects, say legacy coal plants that are now uneconomic um, between utilities and customers who pays. And here, um, low cost financing can really help. Um, in the United States, uh, this, there's a growing movement to do something called securitization at the state level. And now the Department of Energy Loan Program Office has low cost financing available for new um, renewable projects that reinvest in um, coal, coal communities. So um, there are ways to address utility incentives. Um, and you know, part of that is making sure that the, the mandates or policy direction from the state is clear that they want to get to a net zero grid. Promoting competition and customer choice is another way um, you know, to ensure that when there's a dissonance between utility investment plans and what customers want, customers have a way to get it. Next slide, please. And then finally, uh, research development and deployment uh, policies are key as well. So we need to start now if we wanna reach uh, net zero uh, electricity system by say 2035, which is President Biden's goal and, and sort of a Paris aligned target, um, we need to demonstrate the next fleet of zero carbon technologies. Um, and we need to provide sort of low risk environments for the utilities that are managing this transition to learn by doing. Um, we also uh, need to get away from just a myopic focus on the least cost energy resource because these resources, they, they get on a learning curve, they provide resource diversity, resilience benefits that are not easily quantified. Um, and then finally, we have to avoid staying focused on like one advanced technology, right? It's not all hydrogen, it's not all carbon capture and sequestration, um, it's sort of all of the above. And so a more diverse system is more resilient and we need to put a lot of eggs in a lot of different baskets here to reach a net zero reliable electricity system. Next slide. All right, so one more slide. Um, just to sort of preview um, where we're going uh, and some of the sort of follow on presentations that you'll hear if you keep coming to this series. Um, as Michelle alluded to, a clean grid is, is a necessary condition for an affordable net zero energy system. Uh, and uh, as we electrify, particularly buildings, industry, and transportation, um, it will double or triple uh, electricity demand. You see that purple wedge there, that's hydrogen. Um, and you know, depending on the country, you hear targets in the EU, for example, um, that are going really big on hydrogen. So that wedge could be, you know, that's a relatively small sort of wedge there. Uh, in other countries, it'll be much larger. Um, so yeah, clean electricity, and a growing grid, that's a sort of necessary condition to reducing emissions in these other sectors. Next slide, please. Um, so here's just a, a look at um, transportation. Um, you can see how much uh, basically storage you get from EV batteries relative to, um, you know, like dedicated um, storage on the grid in this graphic. Um, so if you can plan the grid around the charging needs of these batteries um, and also interact with and provide price signals for the batteries to charge um, and maybe in the distant future, even discharge to provide power back to the grid when needed, there's a big business model and big sort of win um, for customers and for grid reliability there on the table. Next slide. Um, and uh, here you can see buildings create their own challenges for grid, for grid decarbonization. And this is, I'm very close to the end here. Um, buildings, because right now the main way that um, like low temperature climate buildings uh, get heat in the winter is from natural gas or oil. Um, if we electrify uh, by converting those to heat pumps, what now in the US, for example, and many other places is a summer peaking system. And that's sort of how we plan the grid is like peak happens in the summer. Um, will become a winter peaking system or it'll have dual peaks. It'll have a big peak in the summer and big peak in the winter. Renewable resources perform differently in the summer and winter. You know, 
wind um, you know tends to um, tends to be sort of relatively even but uh, tends to have a peak in one or the other solar obviously peaks in the summer um, and so some of the uh, sort of current reliability practices also will have to evolve next slide and then industry um, electrifying industry uh, adds big sources of electricity demand um, but there are also big loads that can be flexible um, and uh, as I alluded to earlier some of the uses will will rely on low carbon electrolytic hydrogen uh, which is a very flexible load next slide so in summary some takeaways for you all um, there's a significant opportunity for near-term growth in clean electricity. Um, let's focus right now on using existing technology to reach a mostly carbon-free system while we invest in the technologies we need to get all the way there. Um, resource diversity and flexibility are key to a clean grid. Um, there are a relatively small handful of policies or policy areas that can speed the path to a clean grid. Um, and this will affect other sectors' ability to decarbonize, and those sectors will potentially be able to help the grid decarbonize as well. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michelle. Um, that was a great presentation. I took, I was scribbling furiously trying to get my thoughts on paper and we'll have a bit of time at the end for Q&A but I'm going to pass it along to the Center for Environmental Policies Director Dan Fiorino to provide some comments on his research thus far and we'll come back okay. for Q&A so if anybody has questions please drop them in the Q&A um, portion of this uh, webinar feature there should be a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen but go ahead Dan okay Thank you, and, and thanks, uh, Mike and Michelle, for a very interesting presentation on the electricity system. And um, first, just a, a couple of general comments. Um, it is entirely appropriate that a um, series on uh, climate mitigation should give a prominent role to the energy system, because if, you, if, we, if we don't clean up the, the global energy system, um, we're, we're not going to mitigate the causes of climate change. It's, um, I think, uh, generally um, about two thirds of greenhouse gases that are causing the problem are related to the energy system. Um, there also are a lot of uh, public health and, and environmental reasons to uh, think about a clean energy transition. Um, air pollution is a major threat to public health. Uh, the energy system uses lots and lots of water. Um, there are many co-benefits in terms of reduced energy costs and potential um, increases in employment opportunities. So it is entirely appropriate that we give a lot of attention to the energy system when we think about climate change and other environmental problems. Um, so, and, and I do like always like to emphasize the the co-benefits, the health and, and other benefits. The and this is a, a really interesting roadmap and identifies a, a lot of issues. So let me just identify some other complications that um, come with this. One is that um, decarbonizing electricity is. I mean, all of this is hard, but decarbonizing electricity is sort of the easier part. <laughs> Of, of the clean energy transition. The, the, the really tough ones are you know, transportation, uh, particularly long distance uh, freight, uh, aviation, uh, ocean shipping, and of course, heavy industry where there often are heat requirements that renewable electricity can't meet or often uh, fossil fuels are a, a, an input into production. So um, there's certainly a lot of challenges there. And I've always been a fan of the concept of carbon lock-in. And I, I've already seen one or two questions that relate to carbon lock-in. That's the idea that we have built a lot of infrastructure, um, behavior, investments, um, political um, interests around the existing fossil fuel-based energy system. And it's going to be we have to overcome that lock-in 
and it's it's very challenging and difficult. So let me just just point out a couple of things that we need to worry about. Um, we've gotten a very interesting picture of how decarbonization of the electricity system could occur. Again, we also have to then, as as um, Mike and Michelle pointed out, we have to transfer those benefits to uh, transportation and industrial activity and buildings and other kinds of things. So areas where we currently rely on fossil fuels, we have to electrify and then use green generated electricity to then um, meet energy needs in those areas. But here are some, some difficult areas, I think. The, the, the intermittency is just gonna be a continually challenge that um, re renewable energy, wind, and, and solar and the good news about clean energy is that just the the amazing rapid uh, reductions in costs of solar PV and and wind PV in particular. Um, decades ago, I think it would have been hard to imagine that the, the the technologies would be where they are now, which is very competitive and sometimes superior in cost terms. But you know, sometimes the sun isn't there and the wind isn't there, and, and that variability is going to be an issue. And so we got to, I, I love the visual on baseline and intermediate and, and peak load because that illustrates many of the challenges. But generally, you know, the higher we go um, toward an entirely renewable based system, the more challenging um, is just balancing the grid. And we saw a good picture of some of the ways you do that. I mean, I think efficiency, energy efficiency overall is going to be absolutely critical. We have to be constantly uh, improving our ability to, to do what we want to do and, and apply new technologies that give us more efficiency. Um, changing the shape of the electricity demand, peak shaving, those kinds of things, draw upon a bigger area. Um, lots of new technologies, you know, the, the whole idea of the smart grid is going to help. So I think intermittency will be a continual challenge. It's not fatal, but uh, it's an important one. Um, there uh, are going to be some real issues with permitting. The Progressive Policy Institute did a report in September that pointed out many of the challenges. So just getting renewable energy facilities cited and then getting the, the transmission capacity um, legally approved and authorized and permitted and built are going to be um, certainly challenges. And I think just the um, in um, developing countries, there's just going to be a huge energy demand. And I think it's, that's going to be an area where it's going to be tough to get off coal. The Washington Post had a story last week about um, coal demand and coal use in, in India. And, you know, we are a rapidly growing economy with a large population. There's a big energy appetite and the coal is there. And um, so it'll, it'll be tempting to draw upon that. So those are some thoughts. I think it, um, I'm optimistic about these things happening, but um, it will be very difficult, both politically, I think politically more difficult than than even some of the economics and the technologies. Albert Einstein once said that um, politics is more difficult than physics. And I think the energy transition is one area where that is appropriate. So I'll turn it back to you, Gabriela. Well, thank you for those comments, Dan. Yes, and I, I tend to agree that the policy aspects of this decarbonization transition and clean energy transition um, are, are going to be a wicked problem. And uh, Michael touched on the economic activity and the different incentives when it comes to the distributing capital within the energy industry to achieve this clean energy transition. And all of those stir in my brain frequently um, because not only is it important to create policy, refine policy, or change it in order to achieve this transition, but also to do it in a meaningful way that incorporates populations that have either been ignored in the in the former energy sector outside of the clean energy transition and those that we want to ensure have the benefits of this clean energy transition that didn't benefit in the last time. So um, 
I, I hear all of you and, and it's, I'm glad to have this conversation. So looking at some of the questions that have been posed in the chat, um, one question that came up that's pretty general, I'll ask Michelle or Michael to answer are, what are the constraints from transition and distribution which limit deployment and reliability of renewable power generation? Gabrielle, you work at EPRI. I, I think you should weigh <laughs> in on this too. Um, I mean, where, where to start? I, I would say that that is right now in many places the, the kind of leading constraint. Um, so I think it is useful to break up the two uh, transmission and distribution. On the transmission side, um, well, we had one graphic that we decided not to share, but it's um, there's something called the interconnection queue. It's basically a big line uh, that developers get into to say, I want to interconnect into the transmission system. Um, and the system operator or utility has to do a study and say, you know, can you interconnect here? Uh, if not, what is the cost of the upgrades to the grid needed to accommodate the new generation? Um, and that used to be a relatively sort of quick um, and straightforward process. But as renewable generation has increased and sort of taken up all the low hanging fruit on the existing grid, now, the studies are more complex. The costs that developers face tend to be higher because there are needs for instead of like one little interconnecting line, you actually have to go up and like, you know, uh, increase the capacity of say um, a higher voltage line or or a circuit or whatever. You can think of it as like uh, you used to only have to build the on ramp to a highway, and now you have to like put a new lane on the highway. Um, but once once you put that new lane, there's actually lots of projects behind that one that may benefit. So there's like a, there's lots of financial sort of who pays and who benefits problems here that policy has yet to catch up to. And FERC is trying to, the federal energy regulators trying to catch up to these, but that's a big issue. The other one is we've barely built any sort of regional scale high voltage transmission in the United States in the last 10 years and, and you know, we're starting to make headway because of some of the new policies in the federal infrastructure packages. But um, to Dan's point about siting uh, and, and permitting, that is just a wicked problem um, where without sort of clearer, stronger federal authority, there's just a huge ability for local uh, state and local sort of governments and, and folks to, 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 to kill these big projects that they don't want in their backyards. Um, on the distribution side, um, I don't know, this is a very long answer, but um, there's sort of the upgrades needed there to accommodate more rooftop and distributed solar and storage. Um, they're starting to hit constraints on that as well, say in California or Hawaii where there's high shares. Um, there's also upgrades needed to accommodate new load. Um, high voltage chargers um, or uh, high, yeah, like, HVDC charging for trucks or, or high capacity vehicles. Those need to be planned and cited, you know, five years in advance. I mean, there's, it's just a tremendous infrastructure challenge and we have to get better at building faster um, and with more confidence and more inclusively from the get-go. Um, and it's just, a, just a, a sort of muscle that the US and, and I think other countries have atrophied. Um, so there's lots of technical challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I appreciate that long-winded answer, and I, I think you did better than I could have. So um, I, I appreciate the analogy as well. I think putting it in those terms helps um, those of us on the call that may not be knowledgeable about it kind of see it in, in, a, in a more high-level way. So I appreciate it. Um, looking at some of these questions as well, one that I wanted to posit from our very own was that renewable demand seems to be increasing as costs go down. This is great news, but what about the sunk costs of coal, coal and oil power plants and the power of the fossil fuel lobby? How much of a drag do these interests create on the on decarbonization and its timing? And Michelle, I'm not sure if you wanna provide some comments, um, but please feel free either of you or Dan even. Yeah, yeah, I can start off. Um, yeah, so that's definitely a huge barrier, um, I think across the country just for the regulated utilities 
there's something like $176 billion in debt still remaining to be paid off on fossil fuel power plants. And for those utilities, you know, those are long-term contracts that essentially customers are repaying that debt over the course of 30 years or more. So um, getting that debt paid off and uh, moving toward cleaner resources is a kind of one of the central issues of getting renewables online faster. And so Mike talked about it a little bit in his kind of policy recommendation section about um, methods to kind of get that debt paid off um, and, you know, freeing up that capital for utilities to reinvest in new clean, which again is central to, you know, how they make money. So it should be something that they want to do. So there's kind of two ways of uh, doing that in policy right now. One is securitization, which is um, kind of a way for utilities to access low cost financing um, just to repay off their debt um, at a lower rate, which can save customers billions of dollars. And that's been kind of legislatively enabled in several states across the country. Um, but there's still a lot of states where that's not uh, kind of explicitly allowed. And so utilities have been reluctant to kind of tap into that and regulators have been reluctant to allow it. So the um, Inflation Reduction Act actually created a program called the Energy Infrastructure Reinvestment Program um, through the Department of Energy, which is basically a loan program where utilities can apply for low cost financing, um, but it has to be tied to construction of new cleaner resources at kind of the same site as the fossil, as the old fossil. So that's a really uh, kind of exciting program because it's something that not only incentivizes the building of new clean, um, but it also incentivizes the building of new clean in communities that have been impacted by fossil fuel infrastructure for so long and really jumpstarting um, the transition for not only the electricity system, but also the communities who have um, both depended on those, those fossil fuel jobs, but also been impacted by that fossil fuel pollution. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Um, Thank you, Michelle. No, that was a that was a very succinct and, and lovely answer. Um, another another question in the chat mentions how we've been really discussing policy and how it's a critical lever for change in this in this sector. Um, and folks are curious how we see the role of the private sector leading um, part of this transition, if it will, and how it would. Um, something I noticed from my work at EPRI is that. A lot of our utilities are investor owned. So as investors, you know, require or inquire about aspects of decarbonization, aspects of environmental justice and this just transition, that is a huge lever for these power companies. Um, so that's just something from my end, but Michael, Dan, where, how do you guys see the private sector um, being incorporated here? Well, policy is another critical lever as well. Yeah, well, the, the, I mean, the private sector is is going to carry the load. <laughs> um, most of the investment will come from the private sector. I think the role of government is to to provide the incentives, positive and negative. With the Inflation Reduction Act, we're seeing lots and lots of positive incentives. So um, let's hope that has the desired effect. But also, government's going to have to coordinate all these different moving parts. So, um, you know, electric vehicles are good, but if you're if you're generating um, electricity from fossil fuels, you're not getting the kind of benefit you would get. You need transmission. Um, a lot of the electricity system is going to expand considerably as we electrify more and more end uses. Um, renewables mean we're getting energy from different or electricity from different generating sources, and that will require more transmission and new kinds of transmission. So I think government has a very important role to play in providing incentives, in um, coordinating and managing all these difficult um, choices and, and processes. Um, but yeah, the private sector is absolutely critical, and that's that's where the most of the money <laughs> is going to be coming from. Yeah, the I totally agree with what Dan is saying. Um, the one thing I would add is 
there's we we have a lot we've made a lot of progress um, innovating uh, on wind on solar increasingly on batteries one of the other questions from someone was about just like hey you you didn't mention the precipitous fall in the cost of lithium ion batteries um, mm -hmm. which is totally uh, sort of game changing uh, where we were like thinking where is a lot of this flexibility going to come from and you know lo and behold like batteries have been scaling up in large part due to the electricity or the electric vehicle transition now we can sort of mass produce these things much more cheaply and we'll you know continue to do so cuz that industry is going to double and double again and double again so there's lots of um, additional learning that will come but there's a next wave of, of of technologies that we need to continue innovating around as well and yeah. government is good at reducing the risk of investing in innovation but not innovating itself so yeah. um there's going to be right. a lot of sort of you know invest there's room for sort of you know venture capital and lots of innovation around technologies we haven't even invented yet that will come to to sort of help solve these problems and that's why we need to sort of maintain i think uh the integrity of some of these electricity markets we need to provide a clear signal to the market that if you invest in these technologies, there will be a market and a profit for you. Um, so right. it can't just do it all administratively and like planning wise, it's it's gotta be, uh, you know, propelled through markets. And many power companies are looking to sustainable financing and looking to green bonds, et cetera, mm -hmm. to help throttle that the private sector towards these types of investments and create, like you said, a market for them, a drive for them. Um, so I will pass it back to Todd. I appreciate all the panelists coming on, presenting and providing comments. I know we are at two o'clock, a little bit over. So I will pass to Todd for final comments. And again, appreciate everybody for being here and the panelists for speaking as well. Thank you. Many thanks, Gabriella. Uh, does anybody have any final comments they'd like to make? Um, we, we have a few more minutes. Uh, if if anyone would like to to add any concluding statements, any of the panelists, uh, okay. In which case, I just want to mention, uh, with many thanks, that as Dan said, the the you know the private sector is carrying the load, but here at on this webinar, uh, we appreciate Energy Innovation and the Center for Environmental Policy for carrying the load. And we are entering peak load, which is several more webinars in a short time span. That is to say uh, that on March 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will have the next of these webinars, which will focus on issues of uh, buildings and transportation sectors. And we'll have uh, experts from energy innovation and also from uh, from the urban planning sphere, such as the city planner of Vienna, Virginia. So we'll we'll have an interesting webinar then. Um, and I also want to thank the School of Public Affairs and in particular uh, Chanel Ashman, who coordinated this behind the scenes. So thank you, and thank you also to uh, to Mich Michelle Solomon, Michael O'Boyle, uh, to Dan Fiorino, to Gabriella Siegfried, and you know, we hope to see all of you back soon at the next of these webinars. And uh, we'll sign off and wish you all a wonderful day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.